let's get started with the final session for our conference. Um, it's the second part of the workshop that we started yesterday with IATA, but this time with another very important topic, which is sa safely transporting personal mobility devices by air. Um, of course, this is a very important topic for advancing air travel accessibility as mobility aids are crucial for the independent independence of passengers with disabilities. Here to discuss this and let us know more about it, we have our distinguished panelists that, that I'd like to call now. Uh, Special Handling Manager from Danata in the UAE, Ms. Moza Sa Saeed Rumehi. And <clears throat> our second panelist is Founder and Executive Director of the Open Doors Organization from the United States, Mr. Eric Lip. Again, this workshop will be, uh, or panel discussion will be uh, moderated by my friend and colleague again, Ms. Linda Ristagno from IATA, Switzerland. Uh, as same as yesterday, we, we are going today to cover another uh, topic that is, uh, sorry, okay, that is uh, mobility aids handling. Uh, so this workshop is going to, to be very technical in the sense that we are going to look at the um, uh, procedures for the safe loading and the securing of the mobility aids, so the wheelchairs, battery powered mostly, in the cargo compartment of the, um, of the aircraft. Uh, when we started working on this topic, uh, it was uh, 2021, and... Um, uh, okay. Okay. When we started working on this topic, it was 2021, and uh, one of the reasons was because we wanted to understand uh, how we could reduce the damage of um, uh, mobility aids uh, um, during the uh, transportation uh, by, by air. So the first thing that we did was to launch uh, a mobility aids action group. Um, it, it was an action group that was composed by uh, different stakeholders, actually all the stakeholders uh, in, the, um, in the travel chain. So airlines, airports, uh, and uh, mobility aids, uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, um, the disability community, uh, handling companies, uh, uh, research. Uh, uh, we had as well uh, regulators in the working group. This was a huge working group. We were something like 30 uh, stakeholders. So the reason was, uh, first of all, to understand why uh, mobility aids uh, uh, were damaged or mishandled, so uh, missed during the transportation, and how we could improve on, um, on this. The reason was mainly because uh, we understand that um, uh, every time the mobility aids, uh, uh, a passenger uh, mobility aids uh, uh, is damaged, uh, uh, we are removing uh, independence, so we are taking away the uh, independence from the, from the passengers. And if and if we know that the number of mobility aids that are, that are damaged during the transportation is not so high, even one is way too much. So we said, how we can do this? Of course, we can improve on certain uh, policies, but we need to look at procedures and first of all, to understand what's going on. So the first thing that the action group worked on uh, was to identify on the several issues that worked against uh, the ability to, to transport these, um, these aids. And um, uh, for example, uh, we discovered a few things. Uh, um, uh, one was uh, uh, the education uh, component. So how we are training uh, um, the staff who is loading uh, the aid then um, what, is, what are the challenges that our staff has when the mobility aid is, um, is, uh, is loaded, um, is received uh, for transportation? So for example, the size and dimension of some mobility aids doesn't fit with the cargo door of, of, of the aircraft. The weight of some devices is way too much or for the, for the balance, so we have to look at, for example, in which aircraft the, the mobility aid can be, can be loaded. 
um, the weight and um, and the dimension of the um, uh, of the some of these devices, we discovered that it presents risk of injury to ground staff. This was something that I didn't know, but for example, some staff, due to the lack of uh, equipment uh, um, at the airports, for example, some staff are loading the mobility aid uh, literally manually, uh, and some mobility aids can be very, very heavy, especially those that are uh, um, that are um, battery powered and that are uh, built around the need of um, of uh, the person. Another thing that we discovered was that the design uh, of many mobility aids and the, the design of the aircraft don't fit each other. But the most important uh, uh, thing was that, that we discovered that none of these mobility aids, uh, the wheelchairs, are built and are even designed with uh, uh, air transportation in mind. So there are some there is some stuff that is lacking. For example, when the, uh, when the mobility aid is loaded in the cargo compartment, and then I will leave um, uh, Eric to, to, to explain a bit more in detail about this, there are no way of securing the mobility aid in the cargo department, so it can move. Because when it was designed, uh, the mobility aid, the wheelchair, was designed with um, concept that the person shouldn't leave the house or at least the ur urban environment. So it's not fit to be loaded for transportation. And finally, there is also an information gap. The airlines, for example, may not, the airlines, the handlers, the airports may not have the necessary information regarding the dimension of the mobility aids. And the passenger itself doesn't know this information. So we started working on these gaps, and the result was, uh, um, first of all, was guidance for our members. So um, uh, we issued, together with the Mobility Aids Action Group, um, guidance material. You will see some of the outcomes of this guidance material that is available for free uh, use uh, on the IATA website. So I invite you, if you are curious, to see what's in there in the specific. It's written in plain language. So everybody um, really, even if you are not uh, part of the, the, the aviation industry, you understand exactly where the issues are. Because, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, we, we talk with jargons, with codes, with abbreviation. This has been written in a very simple language and especially is written with, by having the um, passenger in mind. Because information is important for us to receive information regarding your aid that has to be loaded uh, in the aircraft and for you to receive information on which kind of information we need and uh, how it, it is going to be to be loaded. Then there are other technical developments that are ongoing uh, and uh, we designed as well other instruments that uh, I leave my colleagues uh, in, the, in the panel to, to explain much better. So I give you the floor, Eric, and... Um, and right. then Musa. Thank you. All right, I guess I'll and kick it off. Before you start, if you have any question, please raise your hand. This, is, this wants to be really a discussion. So anything, any question, just let us know and we will be very, very happy to, to, to answer. Thank you. Uh, all right, hi everybody, it's good to be back. Um, so just to kind of set the stage, this is one of the things I do a lot at work is, is train ground handlers on how to stow assistive devices. But there's one thing that you, the first thing you have to get clear is that we're, what we're discussing here and what we're gonna do here and everything we're gonna talk about, the bottom line is, is that the chairs aren't made to go in the aircraft. And the aircraft are not made to carry the chairs. So we fundamentally have a problem there, right? So it seems that, uh, you know, we break a lot of chairs in the industry. 
Like, you know, if we were to, if I were to go around the room right now and I were to, say, to ask somebody, how many do you think we break? What percentage? People would say 30% or 40% of the chairs we carry we break. Maybe I get it as high as 80 or 90%, but nobody guesses as low as 10 or 5. But the actual percentage in the United States is 1.4%. So overall, we do a pretty good job. The problem is, is that the consequences of damaging somebody's chair is enormous. You can't, you can't defy that. So what, I can, what I'll be telling you today is you know, everything that we're doing in the industry to try to make it work. But again, I've been doing this a long time. Um, one of my solutions early on was to create a company. It's called Global Repair Group. Uh, we, we provide all the U.S. carriers uh, when a, a wheelchair or a assistive device is damaged. An airline, we don't let the airlines handle the claim, and we don't let the airlines be responsible for fixing it. So it's kind of like uh, for the people, by the people. So we kind of take it on our own, and you can use your own people to work on your chair and all that stuff, but we help coordinate it and get all the payments done and get loaners and everything and I wanted to start it to be really quick so that when the minute your chair is damaged, we got right on it. So you don't have to wait on the phone with the airline and wait for somebody to get assigned it. You get global repair and you're all the way on it. And we've been doing it since I think 2000 and I wanna say eight, eight or nine now. Uh, and uh, and it, it's been a really interesting road and it's, it's been tough because I see all the damages on a daily basis. I know exactly how many chairs every airline breaks. I get to see pictures of what breaks. And uh, it's tough because, you know, people want to travel. We want to go places in our devices, but uh, they're not, you know, they might be engineered to go on a bus, on a train. So why not on an airplane? Why is it that my chair says when I buy it, when I get my chair, get your scooter or your power wheelchair, you literally get something in the United States that comes on the chair, bolted on there, and it says you're not really allowed to take it out of your house. Don't, you know, uh, you, you, you should only use it for medical appointments and uh, for work. Uh, so they're really not supposed to go out of the house. In, in the United States, we can't buy insurance. If I, if I, hurt my scooter somewhere here, if I run into the wall, which I've been known to do, uh, I can't get it fixed. I have to pay for it out of my own pocket because there's no insurance coverage. So it's a really complex industry, the way that insurance companies and manufacturers uh, work together to reimburse and to get things fixed. So ultimately, we're working as a community, we are working against aviation in general and wheelchairs and the manufacturers in general, and the insurance companies. So we're one against three. And the only thing that we can do is try to minimize the 1.4%. So here's my suggestions. Right away, we can get rid of 30% of the damages, 26% of the damages, because 26% are manual wheelchairs. And manual wheelchairs should always be stowed inside the cabin. The closet in the cabin is where a manual wheelchair should be, should be stowed. So if it fits in there, put it in there, because at Global Repair, we don't have any claims on chairs that get damaged in the cabin. And I know that a lot of times the cabin seems as a place for flight attendants, pilots, first class stuff. If you look on any US aircraft and in Canada, there's a sticker on there that says priority stowage for a wheelchair, because that's what it's there for. And I'm working on the pilots and flight attendants to make sure that it becomes a standard practice across the globe to stow manual chairs there. It's better for the airline operations too, here's why. You don't have the ground handler involved. It doesn't go underneath the plane. You don't have to wait for it to come up. It's that simple. That takes that entire process out of the entire thing. So 
It's less likely to get damaged. It's more efficient and cheaper for the airline to stow it in the closet. The only person it seems to inconvenience are the flight attendants. And I know somebody said they were a flight attendant in here earlier. I apologize uh, in advance, but uh, it is, it's a stickler point with us, but I always remind the airlines, this is exactly what I tell the ground handlers for the airlines, I say, I want you all to remember that the flight attendants don't sign your paycheck. I do. And when you put my wheelchair into the cabin closet, I know it's not gonna break, but I'm a customer for life. But the minute you break it, I'm not flying you again and I'm gonna fly somebody else. And if they break it, I'll go to the next. I'm, I might come back around to you because I might break it everywhere I go, but that's how we do it. So the best thing that we can do is to put those manual chairs in the cabin closet. So any of you manual chair users out there, always ask if you can put it in the closet. I don't recommend fighting over it, but if they're smart, they'll do it. And maybe if we keep asking, they'll get the picture. Okay, so the, the, these are devices, you see the dimensions. You have to know how to fold your own chair when you fly because the airlines don't know how. And there's a lot of different chairs and everybody's chairs are custom made. And I can only train them on how many chairs at once. I bring a big power chair, I bring a scooter, and I can't really uh, train them on that. So really understanding the chair, the size, the dimension, and when I, when I do studies on the ground, the ground handlers, the number one thing they want, well, I'd yell it out, but uh, is they want the weight. How much does the device weigh? Because that's the most important thing to them because that tells them how many people they need to move it. Because sometimes they don't have devices to move them, they have to carry them. It's, a, it's scary, you'd think there are fancy devices to move our chairs, but there's not. So a lot of times they lift them and carry them. That's why the weight is super important. So you have to know how to fold your own chair down and get it ready to fly. You've got to know your battery type because the battery is a scary thing in the world. Because as we were talking, uh, uh, I think I talked about it earlier, you know, the lithium ion batteries, they're making more, we had this discussion at dinner last night. They're designing more power wheelchairs and scooters now with lithium ion batteries. And to me, every time they do that, they're saying to the community, I'm designing something you can't fly in. And it has nothing to do with equality and all that. You can't fly in lithium ion because they can't put them in the aircraft. It's a hazardous material thing. So why, when I started, there was one scooter it was called the Luggy, and it was the only one used lithium ion, and now there's too many for me to count. And so lithium ion batteries have to go in, so we have to know what our batteries are. And a lot of people don't know what their batteries are, but you can't expect the airline to know, because they don't. There's, there's really hard, because even if you tell them you have a non-spillable battery, if you don't know that, then they have to see it. And I don't know if you know how difficult some of the chairs are to get into, but to physically see non-spillable on the battery could take tools, it could take hours, and most of us don't know how to get to our batteries, and we don't want you messing with our chairs that way, but you have to know on your own what you have because they're gonna ask you, and they have no way of knowing unless they see it. So you have to say, I either have a dry, non-spillable battery, I have a lithium ion battery, or I have a wet cell battery. And a wet cell battery means it has to come out of the chair completely. It gets boxed into this separate, it's called a battery box. And they tape the lead and they put the thing, you gotta do all kinds of stuff. It's got a little kit. And it goes in the aircraft separately so that it stays upright. So the other major thing on this in the battery type, the dimensions you need to know is because on a 737, the cargo door opens inward. On an Airbus 319 and 320, the cargo door opens out. So if you have a, a large power chair, and say you have a headrest on it, or even if you take your headrest off, which you should always do, and you fold it down, you have to make that fit. The dimensions still have to fit within those cargo door dimensions. And on a Boeing, you're gonna lose six inches. 
So now in the United States, some airlines are not going to take power chairs on certain aircraft, and here's why. Because when we went to the manufacturers to talk to them, and we told them we put them on their side. We have to put the chair on its side. And you know, the, this is the way I train it too, because the guy said this to me, he said, do you want me to go put your car on its side? Just for 10 seconds, Mr. Lip, that's all. We'll just put it on its side. I was like, no way. He's like, that's what we're doing with our chairs. So now, we're not turning chairs on their side any longer because it likely causes damage to them, right? As it would your car. But that makes it so that if you don't know the dimensions of your chair and it can't fit, you won't be allowed to fly on that aircraft. And you might have to get booked on another flight. But they're doing that now to stop the damages. We used to put them on their side. I have videos of guys literally on their butts in the aircraft, pushing them with their feet. Because that's the only way they could get a 300 pound chair in an aircraft. Because in a 737 in the Airbus, you can't stand up. Everything has to go on its side. You have to tip them over to put them on there. And the minute you tip a power wheelchair on its side and you let it fly for two hours and then you put it back upright, you destroyed it. You didn't destroy it that day, but it's destroyed because it, all of the hydraulics and the fluids and the ball bearings have all shifted to one side and through all the gravity and everything when you fly. And that will tear those up as they come back around. So in a couple months, you've still been ruining all the ball bearings in your chairs. They're not made to go on their side. They're not at all, ever. A wheelchair that is a power wheelchair that has two, four, three wheels is always made to sit upright. So we're not putting them on their sides anymore because of that. And that makes it difficult, too. For some people's devices won't be able to fly. but. You're going to have to be able to know how to do it yourself. Otherwise, you're likely to get some damage if you don't really know the way to do it on your own. Next slide. No, and yes, ju I just wanted to add. So two main things here. Uh, manual wheelchair, if those are foldable, always get with the airlines to let them know that you have foldable wheelchairs if those wheelchairs is possible to uh, stow in the cabin. Not all the cabins are the same, no. as we have to say, <laughs> yep. because the small aircraft are smaller cabins, so those wheelchairs may not fit, even if they are, those are foldable. For battery-powered wheelchairs, it's important the dimensions. We recommend not to tip anymore the wheelchairs, because tipping the wheelchair on the side may cause damages. You would find this on the, um, uh, on the guidance. Because our members uh, and the handlers and the airlines for making the customer, uh, for, for making the wheelchair uh, with the customer, they were rotating the wheelchair uh, without, uh, I mean, uh, just to, to, to fit the wheelchair in the cargo door. But this is not the right way to do. So the recommendation is not to flip the wheelchair, uh, to put the wheelchair on the side, because it's, it can get damaged. The information that you have to provide for uh, those persons who are on a, on a wheelchair are impor important. And, so, and, and as soon as you provide, the sooner the better. Because airlines handlers can get prepared on how, first of all, if that wheelchair fits on that aircraft, or maybe uh, it has to be in another, on another flight, and to understand which kind of components are, for example, removable, which kind of battery uh, is in the wheelchair. Battery is important because it's, uh, uh, batteries are dangerous goods. Um, we have some videos and s of experiences where uh, when batteries are not declared uh, uh, correctly by the customers, simply because sometimes the customers don't know which kind of batteries they have on their wheelchair, those batteries get on fire. So, and it's, um, it's a safety uh, issue. So the sooner you communicate on your dimension, and of course this has to be not a one-way communication, has to be an ongoing communication between the passenger and the airlines, or and the travel agent, if you book your flight through a travel agent. So this is relevant, this is very, very important. 
and um, in the uh, in this guidance you have all those information and uh, even many more on the next slide i think we will call on uh, it will be we will hand over to uh, musa yes on how once the it's booking right. is done the information are provided what happens at the airport, handing over the mobility aid uh, at the personnel at the airport? Musa, have so this is mainly actually for the airport staff, airline and ground handler. As we have already started from the beginning, I mean, uh, Linda has already explained and she had mentioned that uh, mishandling of mobility is not have a huge impact on the passenger with disability. It can lead to the not trusting the airline or the handling, I mean, again, to fly, it can, um, uh, travel experience, definitely, it will be affected, discomfort, uh, stress, financial burden can be there also, and that's what we are not looking for. Every airline and every ground handling and airport, they wanted all the customers, I mean, to be seamless, uh, the journey is very seamless, and I think um, we have already come up with a few points we need uh, the airports, ground handler, and airline to focus on. One of the first one is a flexibility. We need to allow the passenger to hand over the mobility because some of the, I mean, passenger, they wanted to hand over the mobility and use the, the wheelchair which is available in the assistance throughout from check-in. So there should be a flexibility to hand over the mobility either from check-in, boarding, gates, or I mean, uh, in the counters, anywhere. Flexibility should be there so it can me give more comfort for the passenger with disability to move around, in, uh, I mean, if there are wheelchair assistance available. Also, uh, I've seen that Linda, uh, Eric have already touched base on that one, and it's, this is, I feel like, for me, as a ground hand perspective, the most important element, which is mm -hmm. accurate information. Yep. Information, it's always been a challenge for the handling, so always accurate information is very important, either from the passenger with disability or from the airline reservation, throughout the ground handling, it gives more, um, uh, I mean, flexibility for the ground hand to understand what the passenger need, how to handle the passenger. And sometimes uh, it's not allowed because when we came to know about the exact issue with the, I mean, uh, uh, mobility aid, it takes, it will be like almost too late and everybody will be like, you know, running and nervous and it looks, I mean, not really good for the, either for the ground handling airline or for the passenger itself. Accuracy information is really very important. Like Eric has mentioned that dimension, weight, type of a battery, all this type of things. I mean, it's really, really important, uh, I mean, information for to handle mobility. It, mobility tag, also it can be dedicated, and this is one of the point actually was come out very strong in the, uh, I mean, our working group because Actually, it will save us a lot of things. I mean, if we have a, a kind of information which can be retrieved and had, I mean, like in case of the passenger, he will not be able to explain exactly what kind of type of the, uh, of the mobility aid or uh, how to be handled. We were suggesting that if we have a mobility tag which has have all the information, it can be easily retrieved. And I think, uh, as far as I heard from uh, Linda, that there will be a specific work Basically, uh, once you give us the information, what we are going to do, you say, yes, we communicate. What are you going to do with this communication, with, with this information that we provide you? So this information needs to be uh, recorded in some way because um, the instructions have to go to the handling. How do we record this information? The, for the moment, there are various means. One of the things that is discussed in IATA is, is being discussed. Um, there are already indications in the guidance material on a mobility aid tag, so a tag that, go, that goes together with the mobility aid. At the beginning, we started discussing about a passport. We were thinking about the passport of mobility aid. This is very difficult to get because at the moment uh, uh, manufacturers are not enough up to speed to, because it should be the manufacturer who creates the, uh, the, the, the passport. Uh, same as we have a passport when we travel, also the mobility aid that is very much, um, very much with, the, with the passenger is uh, part of the, the, the passenger. This is what passengers told us then there sh should have a passport. But for that passport, it should be the, the who creates the mobility aids, right? Who manufactures that? 
And for the moment, this is not really feasible. Also because some of the aids are, once uh, uh, the manufacturer releases, are really uh, modified. modified according to the need of the person. So it's even more difficult. So we came to the conclusion that probably we need to have a tag. So we retrieve this information from the passenger, the main, the most important ones, and we put together in a single format that is comprised of this tag. There are already indications and many airlines already have a mobility aid tag. But IATA wanted to go a bit further than that, so we are discussing to create an, a, a standard that is electronic, and it's uh, uh, related to uh, digital, those kind of digital identities. I'm not really a tech, uh, technology expert, but in, in, in our organization, we are actually discussing really the need of creating a standard, because by creating a standard, the kind of information are always the same, and you can transmit those information along the travel chain from the booking to disembarkation. That is the, the, the objective. So everyone knows what, uh, what they have to expect, the operators and even the passenger. Some are going a bit further, so with, um, uh, with the tag, uh, there is also an, um, the possibility to locate the, the mobility aid when, for example, it is loaded in the cargo hold, where it is, when this, it is discharged, because it's important. I want to know where my baggage is, for example, when I, uh, I travel or my personal stuff, and the mobility aid is personal stuff, right? So some airlines are already going to, to that direction a bit further. We are discussing for the moment to really uh, standardize the information and transmit those information to the to the chain. You know, the U.S. carriers, many of them already have a tag, and when I get, when I turn my chair in at the jet bridge, they scan it, it pops up on my app, it says your chair is on. Then when it goes up the belt loader, the belt loaders have scanners on them, and it says, hey, your chair has been loaded. Then when I get to my destination and it comes off the belt loader, it gets scanned automatically again, and I get a pop-up that says your chair has arrived. So at least I know where it's at, maybe not exactly, but if it doesn't come up quickly at that point, I'm like, well, it's here, so somebody get it and go get it and bring it. Yeah, actually, Linda have taken some couple of points, but it's okay to re-emphasize about it. And um, we were like talking about like from the handling perspective and airline also, they should be also available to offer uh, assistant wheelchair assistant, which is there available in, in most of the airport, but it sometimes it's not really, flexible with certain airline, but it should be there, I mean, for everybody. It should be streamlined and everybody have to have this kind of offers available. And we were talking about, um, uh, just we were discussing, me and Eric, also about the storage consideration. And we say that airlines should be having now, I mean, like everywhere, everywhere, the cabin storage, like dedicated cabin storage for the wheelchair, which is give more actually flexibility and also encouraging uh, passenger with disability to travel. I mean, because this is, a th I feel like one of the main challenge and main issue that usually the passenger with disability they raise. Cabin storage, I think this is, should be in consideration as well. Uh, also, we were talking about the communication and documentation, which is Eric has also touched base, and maybe in the in the future slides, also the the next slides, he will talk more about it. Communication between the airline, airport staff, and ground handling should be totally open and and effective because this is the way that uh, sometimes the if the airline for certain, I mean, they don't receive, I mean, they have the information, but they don't deliver it properly to the ground handling, it can affect the handling of the passenger with disability. So documentation and uh, communication is the magic word always between mm -hmm. the, all the airport staff and the ground handling airline and, uh, and airline as well. And um, I'll just say, uh, we will complete, I mean, with this, and we'll talk a little bit about the training. Yeah. Training, also one of the, I think it's a love subject for uh, for um, uh, Eric. I will talk about it a little bit, but Eric, he will go more for it. Uh, I think training is one of the important, as a ground handling also for us, is one of the important element. The training should be very much, I mean, I mean, from I mean, below the wing, let's say this above the wing and below the wing, that. 
uh, with regard to the technicality, it's really important because this is what we are getting feedback sometimes from the uh, from the passenger disability that how the way that they ha I mean they deal with the with the wheelchair. It's um, they call it sometimes it's not a wheelchair. They call it their leg. So they get it's very offended sometimes when they say, uh, okay, some incident I've heard some story like one passenger was sitting and he can see from the window that the way that they are handling his wheelchair and it was like he was saying my leg, my leg. I mean, it's really, really uh, the staff they need to understand how to handle. I mean, those type of wheelchair or any type of wheelchair with dignity. Um, uh, I mean, because they need to understand it's their leg. It's not just an equipment. Uh, understanding also the regulation behind it, the requirement, how they handled, all the technicalities. So training is really one of the important elements, uh, I mean, to have this effective. Yeah, you want to elaborate more? You know, the, and the training is super important, and that's what we're going to get into now is, you know, most of the airlines, believe it or not, uh, they don't train specifically on this topic. Mm. And um, the reasons that are vary because anywhere from the fact that they get a little bit of it in their initial training and they don't see them very often, maybe once or twice a month. Uh, but that's why we go around and we do it for free because uh, they should better they hear it from us too because they can see what happens. And a lot of times something happens on my trip and we find a, a gap like here, just flying here uh, yesterday or the day before, um, I realized that there was no communication as to Normally, I would require my, my scooter to come to the jet bridge door because I flew on a U.S. carrier, and under the U.S. law, they're required to give it to me at the door if that's where I want it. And I could make them do it, and I could do everything, but they didn't want to do it, so I said, okay, you can take me to baggage claim because I knew I'd get a great service from Musa's folks, which I did. They were wonderful. We get to baggage claim, though, and their folks don't really communicate with the baggage handlers the people are bringing the luggage to the belt. And then there's another group who actually sit around the belt loaders here in Dubai, and they help with various things. They wear like a tan outfit. And so it took uh, Musa's person to work with the guy who on the ground there, and they both figured out that it should have come up by now because we saw the luggage for my flight. So then they both kind of talked and split up. And sure enough, uh, we went to the baggage services with me and one of the guys, and they started looking my luggage up. And the other guy, about 10 minutes later, he came back with a luggage cart, and my scooter was, he had put it on the luggage cart, and he found it sitting in the back. But there was no communication. That's, we see that the reason is, is all somebody had to say to me is, Mr. Lip, it's going to be about five minutes. We're going to get it right here. It's going to come here. But that's not what I got. I got, we don't know where it's coming. And I'm thinking, well, gee, am I the first guy who's been to Dubai in a scooter? I'm like, no, because I've been here four times. So I've been here before. They've seen a scooter. I know that. So, yes, so I'm, I'm thinking, how could they not know where it goes? But they don't, because that's just the way the system works. And, um, we, you know, we're working on it now because yeah. we see that there is a gap. It's like a system, like, like something like we call above the wing, below the wing, and people sometimes they do miscommunication. Right. Yeah. And it's super tough to do that. All right, so... Going on to this slide here, this is a slide that I use when I do most of my trainings with the airlines themselves. I encourage the ground handlers to come up and talk face to face with a person who has a power wheelchair. Talk to them and explain so you can get a communication on how you want it secured and stowed. And then I could tell you, yeah, I can do that or no, I can't do that. But we recommend taking as many parts on the aircraft. All the carriers we work with, which is 60 carriers in the, in the globe, we require you to take your seat cushion in the aircraft with you at all times. Your seat cushion can be removed and always should go inside the aircraft with you. Don't ever let your seat cushion go underneath the aircraft because the catch is this, and Linda alluded to it earlier. Most people with disabilities think that we stow our wheelchairs in the aircraft in a padded area where they tie it down nice and neat. That's not what happens. The only carrier that ties your wheelchair down, I know, on a consistent basis is British Airways. And they put it in a container, and it's amazing, and they don't break many chairs at all because they put it in these containers. It takes more time, and you had to buy this container, but it works. Here's the thing is that 
on other, like a 737 in an Airbus, there's no tracks on the bottom, so they're not tying chairs down. So think of this, on takeoff on landing, well, think of landing. When you come in landing and you hit the ground, what happens to all the luggage in the bin? It goes up. Whew. So your 400-pound chair or 300-pound chair goes up, and it's smashing automatically against the top of the bin. To avoid causing damage, the handlers use luggage and surround your chairs with luggage, and then sometimes even put it on top. That's why you can't put your seat cushion in there, because it might have a piece of luggage on it, so that it will break the thing. Some people have large power chairs. To fit them in, the seat, it doesn't go like this. It goes backwards, and it lies flat. And then we put luggage underneath it, and you can't put luggage on top of it, otherwise you'd probably break it, so we don't. But then if, if on takeoff and landing, even if you put luggage underneath the back that's folded down, it's still going to hit the bottom of the aircraft. And you know what happens a lot of times? It cracks. We lose a lot of tires, arm rails, armrests, a lot of stuff gets damaged. So these are the things we recommend you take it in. Side guards for manual chair users. We have these things called side guards that so your clothes don't get into your wheels. Those fall off because they're not even Velcroed in there. They're just placed in there. And when they fall off in the bin, nobody knows what they are. They go directly in the garbage. They think it's part of a luggage or whatever, and it goes right in the garbage. So side guards are a thing. The, the thing you want to have remain in there is your battery. If it doesn't have to come off, you don't want it to come off. And under IATA's guidance, now they have a higher IATA allows a higher watt hour for a lithium ion than I do. It's, a, it, uh, it's actually, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a, not actually IATA. It's uh, International Civil Aviation Organization IKO. regulations. IKO. It's IKEA regulations. And just one point on the tie down. There are no, no tie downs, if not, I mean, um, they think that chairs bump all the time. No, we, we secure wheelchairs. Uh, and uh, the fact is that there is no tie down. We had to develop, our handlers had to develop procedures to secure the chair in a way that they don't move. Now, certain regulations allow the chairs to be loaded uh, on the container on where we, yeah. we load uh, uh, cargo, you know, on the ULD. Other regulations and also aircraft's configuration, the cargo hold doesn't allow uh, ULD. So those wheelchairs are uh, secured in a way that they don't, um, during turbulences, for example, or during takeoff and landing, they don't bump, but it's important that, for example, whatever is removable is removed because, I mean, uh, a, a aircraft flies and there are movements. So, uh, for example, joysticks if ne has to be removed or all the amenities that can be, should be, and this is what is also in this guidance specifically, should be taken with the passenger and stowed in the, um, in, in, in the cabin. We have also to say that when we, we did this, uh, this work with the Mobility Aids Action Group, um, there was the National Research Council of Canada who had already done a parallel research specific on the securement. So they came uh, out, they, they couldn't be here today with us. But they came out with a, um, a lot of solutions that we have taken and put in the guidance and the handlers are implementing. Uh, yeah. My friend Musa yeah. can tell about um, more about that, yeah. We're doing our best. The problem is, is that it's never gonna be perfect. We're not gonna get the number to zero and that's where it needs to be. It can't be even at 1%. It can't be at a half a percent. We got to get it to zero, and to get it from, and to clear this last 1.4 percent, we're going to need the help of everybody. It can't, uh, it can't just be the community. It can't just be us, you know, screaming and banging. Uh, you know, even the solutions that we have are not foolproof. 
So it does not mean that these solutions that we have are gonna always work every time because every aircraft is different, every chair is different, and every person is, every situation, weather, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into it. You would think it, it would be easier, but it just it is, the more you look at it, the more complex an issue it gets, and that's what makes it really difficult. But overall, you can, you can really do the best by knowing your chair, uh, knowing the aircraft, getting the most information you can, and then going there armed with knowledge. And give it on time. And get the, yeah, and get there on time. If you, if you can get there right two hours before your flight, and at least be at your gate one hour before flight so that if they have to, the ground handler can come up and talk to you. Sometimes it's better if they just put the eyes on your chair. I like when they come up to see my scooter so that they know what it looks like, and they're like, oh, it's not that bad, or da da da. If they have any questions, they can ask but you can't be afraid to let the ground crews come up and talk. And we gotta be ready when they come to talk to us. We gotta be prepared with everything we can about our chairs so that we get the best chance of survival. Survival, right? It makes sound you so want different. to take job baits or I, I, I can take with them in yeah. regards of job baits, okay. So uh, I was mentioning before that we worked with the National Research Council of uh, Canada. Um, and uh, one of the things that came out was with the recommendations on the securing. But first of all, once we have the information, what do we do with those information? We have to use as well to pass information to the persons uh, uh, that have, who have to, to load the mobility aid in the cargo compartment. How do we do this? We created what we call job aids that are very simple um, steps that the handlers have to follow at each uh, point of the loading uh, and um, uh, first receiving, handing over to the, um, to the under the wings, yeah. <laughs> yes, <Blow away. laughs> uh, the loading and then the securing. So there are different steps in this job bait, and um, you will see if you are really the, have really the curiosity to download this this guidance. And it's very simple. This is we not tell only for aviation industry; yes. even for the common people. I mean, the, yeah, if exact. they educate themselves, it, is. Yes. it will be more easier for the airport aviation industry. I mean, to deal with it. Yeah, it's uh, it's the steps that each has to follow. So I don't know. There are many many things. Uh, uh, so we basically uh, broke uh, complex tasks in very simple steps to follow. And the is next slide, yeah. I yeah. think that's our last slide. Yeah, this is the last slide. This is the last slide. This is the last slide. Oh, okay. So. Questions? So the question is, is we talk about the 1.4% being the overall breakage number. Do we have statistics on what types of breakage that we have? Um, no, we don't. We don't have that. I actually, it's not something that's collected by the government, but I make it available because I make them go back at the end and look at all the damages so we know what breaks most often. Yes. And what can we do to reduce those breakage? We are, we got that numbers for you. If you, we're happy to share them. I can tell you like the number one thing that breaks are armrests. And the number two things are the joysticks yeah. uh, because we, you know, the joysticks just are not made to be in an aircraft uncovered and open to the elements. Yeah. There you go. So just like you said, it's hard to get it down to 0%. But the best thing we can do is identify what is that small little percentage made out from? And then we can reduce that just by targeting, removing those things. Armrests are, a lot of them are removable, so they could be part of the uh, ground crew's task to just remove them, put them down. Or if it's the joysticks, I would say almost all joysticks are removable. So a little training on just remove them, pad them, secure them. One of the carriers right now we remove them, but a lot of times there's zip ties on there and people don't want you to cut their zip ties. But one of the carriers, Delta Airlines now, at their stations all have zip ties that are removable zip ties. 
So they're gonna cut your zip ties, tell you to take your joystick off, and then they're gonna give you zip ties when you get there to zip tie it back on. Yeah, exactly, and we have customers in Saudi Arabia wanting us to deliver a fully assembled chair. So what we do, because we, they don't want to add the joystick, they want it fully assembled. So we have to figure out a way to package the joystick, fit it on the armrest, which like you said, the joystick is the most sensitive part. You smash a joystick, it's gone. gone. So we have to create a box around it, so no matter how you bash it, all the pressure goes onto the chair, not on the joystick itself. So I've got to tell you, I've had universities from Carnegie Mellon to Northwestern in the United States, and I can tell everybody, if you make a device that can go over a joystick, I can make you a millionaire. <laughs> I can help you out a lot. If you can make it, so I can't engineer, yeah. I can't even draw a stick figure. But I'm telling you, if you get a device that could cover a joystick, then you've got a winner. I can sell it for you. I don't, you don't even need my help. Just give me your email address, I'll send yeah. the invoice tomorrow. I can't get anybody to do it, but we just need something to cover the thing. Yeah, it, it is, it's that simple sometimes. Yeah, next. Uh, we were okay. talking about source information regarding what breaks or not. Probably special handling with collaboration through the lost and found of the luggage. Because when somebody has got lost or damaged luggage, we go to uh, the lost and found and the damaged area. We report those are re those re airline reports and we take uh, the claim from the insurances. That could be uh, another starting point to get some data because they would know what exactly has been damaged because they are reporting and then they are compensating against that. So we are counting that. It's stay, staying with the airline. It's never with the, yeah. the grand handling. But yeah, it, but I mean, it does get counted. In collaboration between yeah. you and them in order to we do that. <laughs> and so in the United States, we're counting if it's a manual or power wheelchair, but if it's a rollator, like a walker, it doesn't count. So, and that's the number one thing we break are rollators. It's like 60% of everything we break is a rollator, but it only accounts for 10% of the revenues. We only break about 10% of the power wheelchairs, but it accounts for 70% of the revenues. Because it's really, it's really lopsided. Uh, can I have my question, please? Uh, thank you very much for this panel session. I learned a lot, although I travel a lot, and I had so many good and bad experiences. Um, first of all, f uh, when it comes to uh, communication and information, I think it's very much interesting what you propose about having a standard or something, because um, many uh, air companies, they are taking care, they are pay paying their share, you know, like for example, Air France, they have everything about myself and my dimensions of my wheelchair. We have a card called Safir. So I don't have to upload all the time, you know, they know me. Delta Airlines, they do the same. So when you, uh, Mrs. Linda, you proposed a standard, I think it could be better because uh, even the air companies, you know, the nationals and even the domestic companies, they could do something like that because at the end of the day, we are paying at the same. We are paying the same uh, amount when we are taking a flight ticket as the valids, but we are, you know, required to provide information and paperwork and this and this and this and that. And when it comes to the lithium battery, I think it's an issue because we are allowed to go uh, to have a, a lithium battery of 300 uh, voltage, I mean, uh, water hour, and, and sometimes you don't even know about that. I mean, maybe the companies should put that, you know, in, in, in the requirements with, within that passport or that standard that you may be going to uh, implement. Uh, and then I have another um, uh, comment and question, maybe, uh, regarding um, the slide that I saw with Mrs. Moza and also with your job aid uh, uh, techniques. Uh, it happened to me many times. You spoke, you spoke about the damage, about the wheelchair. And it happened to me, I was, I was crying in tears because I said, this is the beginning of a nightmare because when they broke my, my wheelchair when I at arrival, they said, oh, no worries, we're going to replace it. No, you're not going to replace it. They gave me a manual, um, a manual wheelchair in substitute, and it, it took one month to fix my wheelchair, 
and I am in, 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 in you know, I was in the nightmare, and this is now, and there was no empathy, and I, I, I'd like to inc to include the empathy, uh, the, that soft skill, because Mrs. Moza, you mentioned the uh, dignity and and si professionalism, and as, as, as I think we should add also the empathy when you're gonna uh, train this job as, because there is there was not even empathy, you know, they were like, okay, it's all right, it's not a luggage, by the way, it's just my wheelchair. So I just wanted to add this because I went through so many experiments and I'm thanking you uh, in advance to taking this into account and uh, improving as you are uh, willing to improve all these things because we are far from you know, uh, dignity or equity when it comes to other customers and we pay the same. Thank you. Okay. Real quick, we are training them and the empathy comes in when it's people with disabilities like me, you, other, the people who work for me doing the training because we talk about our stories. And one thing I want you to mention is the Montreal Convention and changing yes. that because that's really important because I think that's something we, I didn't mention but I want you to, because I know what you're trying to do there and I think that's so important what you're trying to do and people don't really know about it. The Montreal Convention, changing it. You know, no, we're not the, changing the not Montreal changing, Convention. You know, it's the a convention. It's, it's an international convention. Right, just the um, payout. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm, I'm really sorry that you had this experience and that you experienced that there was no uh, empathy uh, towards your, um, uh, your needs. Uh, this is something that uh, we are trying to change, but I would like to know more. Uh, regarding the sapphire, I'm, I'm aware of, of, of that, and um, one of the things that was discussed as well and is under discussion is um, uh, how we can make sure, and actually there is a way actually of, uh, um, there are two tools in, uh, in the IATA medical, um, um, uh, medical manual. Uh, Framac and Medif uh, are those, um, are two, um, uh, two examples on how uh, passengers, especially uh, passengers uh, with medical conditions, can provide information to the airlines, and the airlines, uh, uh, in a way, can keep those information. Now, uh, it's also true that there are regulations that we have to abide, I mean, uh, we have to, to be conscious of. Some of these regulations already require airlines to keep information in their uh, system for uh, a certain period of time. There are also other regulations that, on, that do not allow to keep personal information for, uh, for any, any person. And those are particularly stringent in, um, in Europe, as, you, as I'm sure you know. So that's why some, with some members, some members managed to, 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 to go through that. Um, it's, it's not always possible. Uh, and uh, I could provide you like something five policy papers regarding to that only that specific topic. All this to say is that uh, it's true, there are cases, I'm sure that you also had a positive experience because you traveled the world, right? You are here, uh, your chair, thanks God, is uh, in, good, in good condition. So uh, please share also those good experiences, not only the bad experiences. Uh, I, I came with uh, with the uh, Emirates. We had, um, you know, that that um, uh, that container, specific container for my wheelchair. Yeah. It was perfectly well handled, and I would say 70% of my experiments are positive. And this one with Dana was uh, fantastic. Thank you. I had to highlight this one. Sorry about that. Just okay. to share and to improve because I see that you have the willing to do something, yes. Jenny. That's what I'm taking. The, we the, do. The mic. <laughs> We do, and we take uh, every case, there are not too many cases, uh, and this is also good, we take all the case as um, we use as business case, because we, uh, uh, not business case, but we use those to see how we can improve. Same thing as we do with safety, because in my opinion, we should start looking at accessibility with the accessibility at, right? With the accessibility lenses, as we do with safety. It's about safety of the persons and also dignity. 
So what we do in IATA, we take the cases that happen and we discuss with our members and we do practices based to that. That's why there are a number of best practices already existing. So that's why I'd like to have this conversation with you and see how what didn't work and how we can, uh, we can make it better. Um, I'm sure my members would, would agree with this. I think consistency yeah. is something we lack because every airline's different, every airport's different. And I just wanted to mention one other thing about the Montreal Convention. I know in Europe and in Asia, a lot of times if your tear gets damaged, you're gonna get a check for $2,500. I know that Air France does that all the time. And I think it's terrible that in the United States, we're gonna replace your chair, new chair, even though the law says we only have to replace the original purchase price of your chair, but the price goes up, it doesn't go down. So the US carriers and uh, a lot of the foreign carriers will also pay the full price, but they're not required to. Yeah, I, I just wanna add that um, from aviation industry perspective also, Sorry. when, when there's cases happen around I mean, it's not necessary to happen like, you know, over here in the same country. Actually, get attracted to us and we take it as a lesson learned. And we learn from it because we try to prevent re rather than react, which is, I mean, also this is what the, one of the, I mean, um, uh, strategic now we are, I mean, working on it. That uh, we take it, we show it to our team, like, you know, we do like um, a kind of bid you should, I mean, see how this has happened and what happened in that destination or that country. And it might happen over there if we did prevent, I mean, this we should have, I mean, take a learn from it, which is, I mean, also the same path uh, with IATA is going on. Another question? Yep. I have a recommendation for you, Atta. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ustada Moza, mungkin bas tchillin anni mawdu' al-tarjama, ida smahti li. Ay, tfadalai. Awa shay, hayya Allah, kalla dhiyufna liyona, ya marhabu sahla fihum fi limarat. Hada awa shay. Thani shay, abghi aga'arrafkum ala nafsi, ana ismi Reem, ana um al-tifl inda tawahhud, Umar Abdullah al-Hin, 14 sena. ممكن أقول أن ممكن هي ملاحظة على سؤال على تساؤل صار لنا كذا مرة يعني أن إحنا نسافر وطبعا أنا ما أتكلم بس باسمي أنا أتكلم باسم كل أمهاتنا خواتنا اللي عندهم نفس حالة عبد الله من السفير إلى الهاي فانكشن ف يعني واحدة من الأمور اللي تصير لنا في الطيارات أنه أول شيء التذكرة الحين إحنا نس نبغي عيالنا يسافرون فأسعار التذاكر يعني أسعار يعني لازم يكون عندك وجت عشان تسافرين هذا شيء الشيء الثاني أن إذا أنت كنت في البزنس غير واللي كنت في الأكونومي غير وإذا أنت كنت في الأكونومي معاك طفل عنده توحد يبغي عزكم الله الحمام أو الحمام تعرفين في الأكونومي وايد يكون زحمة فالمفروض أنت تستأذنين عشان تروحين البزنس أو الفيرست كلاس ما يخلونك هذا شيء الشيء الثاني أنه ما يخلونا نقعد في الأسيات يعني مثلا صار في أن أنا بحجز تذكرة المفروض أنه يعرفون يسألوني في استبيان هل أنت عندك حالة أصحاب همم أو إعاقات على أساسه يعطونا مثل أقول لك استثناء إن نحن نقعد في الكراسي مش اللي عند الطواري طيب أنا أعرف إن هاي الأماكن المفروض يكون الأب عند الباب وبعدين الولد لأن يكون في مساحة أو على الأقل يسمحون إن الطفل التوحدي مع أبو أو مع أم جدام واللي وراء حد من أهله بحيث إن إذا صار في هاي الحركات النمطية اللي وراء ما يتأذى يكون أهله واحدة من الأمور اللي أنا دائما تصادفني في الطيارة أن عبد الله ولدي مثل ما تعرفون توحد يسمعون أضعافنا يكون عندهم حساسية تقريبا من الصوت فواحدة من الأمور اللي أنا تصادفني أن لما نروح أسكم الله للحمام أكون أنا واقفة عند باب الحمام فأستأذن من الناس اللي واقفين بس ثواني لين عبد الله يمشي جدام ليش؟ لأن عبد الله لو سمع صوت الفلاش طول الرحلة نحن ما نحن رايحين اليابان عشر ساعات فأنا أستأذن من الناس اللي واقفين 
أن سامحوني بس ثواني أنظف الحمام عشان تدخلون وراي هم ما عندهم هذا الشيء حتى المضيفات ما ما يساعدونا ما يساعدونا بس بقيت أسأل أنت متى آخر مرة سافرتي رحنا بالي كان في الصيف إيه هنا أزيد بس أنا شوي شوي بس عشان أنت قلت خي هي خذي راحتك أنا معك أول شيء السؤال بالنسبة حق أسعار التذاكر تيبا بأخذها هاي أوف لأن هاي تقريبا مش يعني وايد كوميرشال أكثر ما هي أفيشن إندستري عرفتي فبأخذها أنا بتكلم معهم عن الأذر شيء شيء the mother of autistic children she first of all she was welcoming you that you are coming over here and everything. She was taking mainly about the challenge that she faced during the travel with the autistic children. Um, she was uh, actually mainly her, her concern was in the aircraft. First of all, that there's no flexibility to give which seats have been available. Um, there's uh, no consideration of the seat because of the situation of the autistic children. Also with the toilet, if, uh, like you know, the, the expenses of uh, the ticket is not affordable sometimes, it's very expensive especially recently that the, the increase of uh, that. So if they are going in economy, the toilet for them is not really fully accessible. It will be always crowded. And sometimes also if she want to clean the toilet after the, her baby, I mean, using it, uh, definitely the um, uh, crew, they don't help, they don't understand. And this is like matter of education for like the crew, they don't have this kind of uh, ليفل اوف اديوكيشن عفوا استاذه موزه هو مش عشان انا انظفه عشان انا لازم عبد الله يبتعد عشان ما يسمع صوت الفلاش الفلاش آه ايوه أوكي. هو لو سمع صوت الفلاش ما بيرجع للحمام لانه آه صوت الفلاش اوكي ويل بي كونسيرن وذ ريجاردز هيز هيز سيتويشن ان كيس اوف ذا فلاش ساوند هي ويل نوت ريتيرن تو ذا تويلت هي كانوت انتر ذا تويلت مينلي انا بس بختصر انه يعني مينلي شي هاد تشالنج Mainly it was in the aircraft actually, with the crew, بس in the aircraft. هو عموما هو تقريبا كله بس أنا أكلمك عن يعني أنا الحين أم وأعرف ال steps اللي لازم أروح لها وإحنا عندنا برنامج من المراكز يعطونا إياه كيف نهيئ أطفالنا يعني أنا صار عندي بروسس طويل علشان أخلي عبد الله يقعد في الطيارة أول بداية علم على صوت السشوار بعدين المكنسة. ما يعطيك البروسس هذا؟ البر المراكز المراكز. الأوتيزم سنتر يعني نفسه. هي نعم. هي نعم أوكي. وبعدها صرت أث... يعني اقطع تذكره ابو ظبي لعمان عمان ابو ظبي بس عشان اعلم ولدي كيف يقعد فهو بروسس طويل لكن انا اكلمك عني انا انا مش مثال بس نحن عندنا امهات ما يقدرون اوكي بس انت احنا انا بتكلم الحين انت انت اوكي انت مثلا متعلمه زياده ايديوكيتد عندك انيشيتيف شي هاز ان انيشيتيف شي هاف بين اولريدي ايديوكيت هير سيلف لايك واتس ذا بروسس هاو تو ايديوكيت هير سيلف تو جيت يوست تو شي هير كونسيرن از كومن She was getting well educated by herself, but she's thinking about the people who cannot be, I mean, they will not know that. Uh, Don't you have an autism program yes. here? Yeah. 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 I would suggest using the local autism program. Yeah, I think, uh, um, okay. And I can be wide relevant. I was just telling that the, the question was not very much relevant to the, what we are discussing, but I can take it separately with her, I mean, after the session, yeah? Yeah. فانا طبعا بس برد عليك لان كان الموضوع مش وايد مع الموضوع اللي احنا نتكلم عليه بس انا ممكن اقعد معك واقول لك اجاوبك على السؤال انا بس عندي نقطه اخيره بقول لك اياها استاذ موزه اللي هو شفتي لما يصير في اللي هو الستبس اللي تعطينا اياه المضي الشاشه علشان انه اذا نزل السيفتي هي هذه انا اشوف ان المفروض ما يقطعون الشاشه على هذيل الاطفال ان شاء الله ان نحن يعني ما صدقنا على الله ان هم قعدوا وحطوا السماعات إيه. فاتمنى يكون في يعني استثناءات في الطياره خلاص انا انا يا فانا بجاوبك على السؤال هذا ممكن اجاوبك عليه بعد ما نخلص السيشن لان هم ما بيكونون يعني الموضوع اللي احنا كنت نتكلم عليه ما له علاقه بكار بالاوتستيك بس انا عندي اجوبه حقك ممكن نتكلم معك عقب ال اوكي اني اني كويشن ريليتد تو ذا سيم توبيك Got one in the back there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Honor. one thing that I see quite a lot of being from Ireland is uh, chairs being damaged by the elements. Um, so not necessarily long-term damage, but short-term damage that when the chairs arrive up to the air bridge, uh, they could be soaking wet and passengers have to get into the chair and, and travel off on, on business or on pleasure. Uh, I'm just curious if there's anything being done about that at the moment. I know we've talked uh, quite a lot about protecting chairs in the hold, but 
Um, I'm wondering if there are any airlines out there who are looking at protecting the chairs in transit from the hold up to the air bridge. Yeah, some of them are. There's some bags out there, but they, they usually only stop surface damage. And then the honest truth is, is that we're being res we have to be responsible for the bag, not anybody else, because the airlines won't buy them, and where are they going to do logistically with them? So we have to buy them ourselves. There's, they've, there's been a bunch of them. I mean, I've been doing this 24 years. I've seen at least a half dozen different bags come in and out. I think it's a part of the solution. It could be Virgin America used to use a bag that they tied down in the front of their aircraft, which was an FAA-approved thing that they had to go through FAA approval on. But there are some that the weather elements is difficult. So I just had it in Chicago, or in the snowstorm I came here in from Chicago to Newark. My scooter comes up and it's soaking wet. And like, you know, nobody's offering to wipe it down or anything. I carry a towel in my backpack because I knew it was going to come up and I carry my towel and I wipe it down myself. But here's the catch. In the past, what happens is, is they're not allowed to get wet. No power chair or scooter is made for moisture. They have not engineered for moisture. Nothing is there to stop the moisture. They're not even partly moisture savory. So a couple days later, my fuse blows because it got wet. And it so after you know being stuck in the middle of nowhere with my fuse blown, I carry around extra fuses. I carry around an entire pack of six fuses everywhere I go, just like for my AFO that I wear, my ankle foot orthotic. I carry around Allen wrenches for that and screwdrivers. I carry around a whole bunch of stuff for my scooter. Yeah, no, thanks, Eric. I'm just, what I'm curious, I suppose, is that you talk about the 1.4%. I'm, I'm curious if, to know if there's more passengers out there who have had chairs damaged, like you just mentioned, with your, with your scooter, after the fact, and maybe that that's not getting reported to the airlines. For sure, it happens after the fact, especially when you tip them on their side. And a lot of people don't claim them. I think it would probably be somewhere around 4 or 5% is what I really think would be an honest number. But there's no scientist, there's no, the 1.4 is a, you know, is a reported number in the US DOT, you can go online and see it, right, yeah. Thanks. And also on the packaging, you know, um, there was some discussion some years ago in regards of this plastic stuff, and it's a no-go, because I mean, packaging is, it, it, in, with the, with plastic, then I mean, it's it, it's not going to be sustainable, and um, so the recommendation is that um, customers they have their own way to cover the the, 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 the wheelchair. One thing is um, uh, stowing the stowage, and uh, the, the 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 securing of, of of the equipment in the cargo hold. The other thing is that the, is really covering for, I mean, for the weather and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And yeah, the problem is some of the boxes, somebody made a box once that would go in an aircraft, but who's gonna buy the box? And what happens when it ends up in a small town? How does it get back to the big station? It was a logistical nightmare. Yep. Got another one, yep. Here first. Uh, I have a suggestion for the year tank that uh, a lot of persons with a disability order their tickets online through booking.com or Mondeo or et cetera. Maybe it could be an idea that the regulations and mandatory requirements that are for air travel, for mobility aids, that we lobby for them to put it on as a thing. It's, it's good business, yeah. It's, it's, it makes it obvious that the easier it is to order your ticket through a certain page, the, the more often you will visit it and go through it. So my recommendation is to lobby for that. This is uh, to create awareness of both the difficulties, but also the requirements that are following traveling as an accessible person. Thank you. I, I'm not sure I understood what, what the recommendation is for the, the online bookings. No, but the regulations and the requirements that are when you're traveling a wheelchair, the weight, the measure, the battery type, etc., that you you put this on the, the or lobby for that they put it on their home pages. So when you order your ticket and you're not aware of these things, which unfortunately a lot of persons are not, they are aware of when they get to the airport. So 
Yes. This could be a way of... Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot really uh, act on, uh, you know, um, online bookings for um, uh, third parties providers. Yeah, you can. But, <laughs> but certainly, um, um, I don't know if you were here yesterday when um, Enac was mentioning about this uh, One Click Away project. Uh, one click away is uh, information for the passengers um, at one click away from the landing page. So what ENAC has done, uh, they have implemented, they, they led this uh, implementation in Italy with the three major Italian carriers. Uh, so as soon as uh, the passenger gets into uh, the, um, the website of the um, national carriers, um, you, land, you have the landing page, you have an icon, you just click on the icon and you have all the information that you need to know and uh, you need to provide to the airline. An important thing that we advocate for um, and, and included, included in the information are also the requirements uh, related to, to mobility aids. So what, pass, uh, what airlines need to, to know, which kind of information we need to have. An important thing that IADA is um, advocating for is the advance notification from passengers. The sooner passengers provide information, but the, the better it is for, for, for our members to process those, those information and take the necessary steps. Now, advanced um, information um, is um, included in the 1107, uh, that is the European Commission regulation uh, for Europe, uh, where passengers uh, um, should provide uh, information related to their um, uh, accessibility requirements at least 48 hours or something like that. It's not a mandatory thing and uh, airlines and airports in this case uh, and assistance providers, even if those information is not, are not provided in advance, uh, have to, uh, and it's normal, uh, to provide the assistance uh, uh, requested. In other jurisdictions, advance notice is recommended, but it's not in the regulation. So one of the important, the, the, the things that I am doing, I'm advocating first with the passengers, telling the passengers, please, please give us the information as soon as possible, because help us to help you. The second thing is with state regulators to tell them, we need this information in advance. It's not discriminatory to ask about the accessibility needs. Um, in some, um, some jurisdictions, it's discrimination to ask the passengers which kind of disability you have. But we need to know which kind of assistance service you need. Because if you are traveling with your mobility aids, it's, it's very difficult for the airlines to process the information related to your mobility aids, especially if it's battery powered and so on, even the storage, loading, the safety security at very last moment. We do, of course we do, because we want to welcome passengers in any way we can, despite there are still uh, issues with that. But help us to help you. And we are doing, um, now the project, uh, the One Click Away started in Italy, but it's going to be implemented uh, in many other parts of um, of, of the world. It started in Italy with under the jurisdiction of, of uh, the Civil Aviation Authority. Other jurisdictions and other members have done by themselves, uh, but the, 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 the principle is still the same. The passenger has all information one click away from the main landing page. Uh, so you know what to expect but also because we want to tell you in plain language, Eric translated uh, in, um, in English uh, uh, the Italian web pages, but we need to, to get uh, anything you can tell us in advance. So um, travel agents, it's a bit more difficult 
uh, on that we need the support of the um, uh, of the um, agency. I mean, uh, yes, uh, of the regulators. I think there was one back. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to know if there is a uh, tourism uh, area brochure, especially for uh, the people determination. Can we get it uh, from uh, any airport uh, regarding the country that we are going to visit? So please feed me. I think this Thank question you. is purely for uh, Dubai tourism, <laughs> which they are now there. I know that there is a brochure always for the traveler, I mean, when they come on Dubai, I mean, airport. As I mean, as a, as a customer, I know that. And there must be also some online, but specific for POD, uh, I'm sure um, I, I don't have any idea about it. I think this is, should be considered more with Dubai tourism. I am not sure that there is anybody here, yeah, but, but we can, I can find out for you and I can let you know. Yeah, but uh, I mean the, over the international airport, not just uh, in, yeah, the, in the, the international airport. I will leave it for Linda. I don't know yeah. if she has any idea. Please. We are working with uh, the UNWTO on certain uh, best practices related to accessible tourism, and we are going to feed them with the, with this. But uh, I, I agree that there should be more information related to, brochure, to that. Brochure. More than brochure, um, there are some... Uh, there are some um, websites. For example, we did this with uh, during COVID. We created with the UNWTO um, a destination website, um, especially for those uh, destination and those uh, locations that were again open for business, and there were accessibility features I I into into that. Uh, this should be covered more on this kind of uh, applications and um, uh, tools. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean? So even in the, in the plane, someti sometimes we found uh, brochures. So, I mean, uh, we need uh, a special uh, brochure for the people determination here for the country for, uh, that we visited. It is easy for us to uh, visit uh, the area there. Yeah, yeah it's a, it's Thank a good you. point, yeah. We, I mean, suggestion can be uh, given to the rel uh, relevant uh, department. I mean, to what this baby can take out of the recommendation also over here. Uh, I think um, the, the aim of the accessibility tourism is to take whatever recommendation and suggestion also and to work out uh, after even the event, yeah. so. Uh, somebody they are already recording all the suggestion and um, I mean things which need to be considered out of this accessibility tourism and I think um, Hassan he's recording this as well so we can take this to the tourism department yeah. Good. thank you Daniela. I I have few things but it will be fast regarding this brochure that she mentioned I've seen in a couple of European airports which is issued by uh, at, at that airport it was issued by Ministry of Transport when we look at different Emirates we have local and uni I mean federal emirate here uh, federal uh, ministry when we look at, for example, Dubai, this is, could be an initiative recommendation, could be given between the special handling as a recommendation to the civil aviation or the airport operator to bro produce simple, simple, thin brochures and to be kept online and as well as at the airport, at the desk. This is kind of another way of educating the, the customer or the end user of this particular, or their families. This is for this one. The, I was going to yeah. comment on the, regarding the thematic. Thematic, which is a thematic, which is used by many of the passenger, pa passenger sales agents. And this is considered to be as a, as a um, let's say, a clear cut, a clear cut reference. And I had issues with that. Wait, I what is it? What's the reference again? The E electronic you should explain what is thematic. Thematic first. is it's tourist uh, travel information manual, which is issued 
and disseminated by ayata. This is we used to have a, it's disseminated by ayata. We used to have a manual one, which is paper based. Now it's a thematic. So therefore, the airline insists to follow that. And the, uh, unfortunately, I, I faced some challenges when during COVID. I am an exempt person from vaccination due to neurodiversity problems. So therefore, the, the, air, the PSAs, I'm not going to mention which airport because it was one of the Gulf airports, not Dubai for sure. Dubai, for example, Bill Spelsey, they were allowing to, to come inside the country during the COVID restriction uh, without PCR, without vaccination. Okay, if you are exempt, I have to show, and I had my permanent exemption. And that airline was insisting to follow e thematic What it was showing is very, very limited. Nothing about COVID, only a simple disabled person without any details. So this is something I wanted to add to, to, to the recommendation to take away back to the office in order really to update these things with exemptions so airlines can follow. So th this is, I wanted to pass on and thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy that you raised this because uh, we had um, um, various issues like this. You, uh, as you know, thematic, um, uh, uh, not everybody knows, but thematic is specific to regulations in the countries. Uh, so, uh, for example, I don't know if you need visa or if you need... Thematic is uh, uh, fitted by governments. Uh, so whatever is... Uh, that's why uh, the um, transmissions is IATA, uh, who is uh, actually helping uh, our members to understand what governments need. So, uh, of course, during COVID, this was very chaotic. Um, and uh, as you know, uh, as everybody knows, uh, countries shut down from one day to the others, and we didn't have clear information on what was needed. There was no multilateral you know, collaboration and so on. And I agree with you, some, we sometimes have issues, uh, not issues, but some, um, we may have some problems to get uh, information from governments. So I, I invite you to, uh, if you want, we can take this uh, uh, together and see how we can, uh, we, can, we can improve the process. Yes, my colleagues actually would, uh, would thank you a lot <laughs> for this. Of course. Okay, thank you. Um, very quickly, and apologies, since I haven't done it this morning, uh, for those uh, delegates and uh, uh, people in the audience who are visually impaired, apologies. I haven't told you that I am in my early 60s. I have short hair. I use a wheelchair, very pretty, the wheelchair and me. Um, and I'm wearing black trousers, a black jacket, a silk shirt with the white and black stripes. I do have short hair, light skin, and green grayish eyes. Okay, so apologies, I should have done this this morning. Um, the question, we are talking about mobility aids, and I do consider uh, a dog um, who provides assistance um, either to a visually impaired person or someone else to be a mobility aid in a way, it's a support. So a quick question and then word of mouth for those who are not here any longer, but you might be friends so you can share this information with them later on, or for those who in any case uh, would like to, to be able to have this information. I'm curious, what happens to that dog? Uh, where is the dog carried? If the flight is a long flight, what happens? Thank you. 
So we handle the service animals for, for four carriers in the US. We do all the paperwork for them. Um, so is your, what's your question? Like, I mean, the dog is treated as like an assist. Well, yeah, it's not a wheelchair, but yet. It is, It right. is uh, an aid, like the wheelchair, to able the person to move around. Right. To improve the mobility. So the dog does take priority in seating and in everything in the cabin. And it here so much so as this. On a foreign flight, on a US carrier, coming to or from a foreign country, even if it's a child that needs the bassinet in the, in the bulkhead, the service animal takes priority over the child in the bassinet. So service animals are really, yeah, they're really highly, uh, you know, they're highly uh, on the totem pole of getting on the aircraft. Uh, so uh, now the new, there's a new law in the US though, and they require paperwork. And the paperwork, you know, you have to fill it out. And for our carriers, it's a service that if you fill it out ahead of time, then you never have to fill out the paperwork again. And every time you fly, you just have to match the, the dog up with your reservation. That's sorry, it. Sorry, Eric. And yep. it is for free, or you have to pay the ticket also for the dog? Always for free. Um, and in the US, you're only allowed to have one, you can take up to two dogs in the United States, but it has to fit, fit in the foot space. And then also you can be required as the service animal to sit in a window seat if the, if, if the dog is you know, encroaching on the foot space. Go ahead. Yes, maybe I do a clarification here. <laughs> so uh, service uh, uh, trained and certified service dogs accompanying a person who has a disability uh, travel with the person who has the disability and of course uh, are, uh, don't pay. Now the issue uh, that we have and uh, I see some of my colleagues because it, this is really a, a, an issue because um, the regulation related to service dogs is not consistent uh, um, all over uh, the different destinations and um, uh, and states. So in the past, we had um, different categories. We had emotional and we had service. Emotional is, it was for people who had emotional conditions and it was uh, um, animals. So this created uh, confusion, uh, problems for, for, for the persons who, because th there was fraudulent use of uh, this, uh, this um, uh, kind of animals, so I, I don't want to go deep into that because it's really uh, um, it was. But w in the United States, uh, there are no emotional support animals anymore. There are psychiatric dogs and service dogs. Now the service dogs uh, um, are those dogs that are trained to perform certain function for the persons for the person who has a disability. So, and are trained and travel with the passenger with a disability on board, uh, of course, with, uh, with all the other categories are pets. And uh, there are regulations related to pets. Uh, IATA has uh, live animals and uh, live animals regulations, and we abide to that. The regulations are also related to in which cage because the dog has to be in the cage if it, this is a pet. pet. It follows the pet regulations. It's not a service dog. A service dog accompanies the, par the person who has a disability. A service yes. dog does a task. In the United States, it doesn't matter what you call the dog. You can call it your emotional support. You can call it your service animal. It's what it does, the task that it performs, that's what makes it the service animal. So a psychiatric dog may do something like uh, surrounding somebody to give them space, or it might uh, you know, be able to place itself around somebody's feet to calm them or something. So it has to have a task. That's the, that's the key, is the task.
I think we're done. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for having us, everybody. Yeah, I really appreciate Kassan Thank and Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, our distinguished panelists. Thank you, everybody. As we come to the end of this conference, we want to thank you for your participation and engagement. We hope that these two days have been informative and thought-provoking and that you have gained new insights and perspectives. I hope that you leave with a renewed sense of purpose and passion for accessible travel and tourism. As we conclude this event, we want to remind you that accessibility is a mindset. It is a fundamental human right. So is this the end of it? Certainly not. The journey towards accessibility is ongoing, and we must continue to work together to create a more inclusive world. Let's continue to push boundaries of what is possible and create a future where everyone can travel and tour the world with dignity and ease. Thank you once again.